recording now. All right. Awesome. I'm going to let in a few more people. All right, everyone. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon. I hope everyone's having a wonderful week so far. Uh, so for those who are hopping in right now, I'm Jill. I am a health coach here with Amovita. I'm also the client and event specialist. So I get to do all of these awesome webinars with all of our awesome coaches. And today we get Coach John, who is the director of career services here in basically means he's just a master career coach, guru, all of the fun stuff. There guru. he is. <laughs> all right. I like the guru. There I knew you'd you want to talk that about That suits this. you. That suits you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, I, I am the director of career services here. The, um, my background is primarily in workforce development, talent development, hiring, recruiting. I've been director of recruitment. Uh, I've, I've been a hiring manager for several firms, large and small. Uh, my own career path has been winding and unusual. I've worked in several different seemingly totally unrelated industries. Uh, and so I love talking about that. I love talking about making these strange jumps from one career to another. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about my, my top 10 steps for making a career transition. What we're going to talk about today is going to focus on moving from one career area to another, but most of the tips here will apply even if you're staying within your same industry. Um, the reality is, even if you're moving from one company in the same industry to another, there's more transition than you think there is. Uh, very few companies, even within the same industry, are carbon copies of one another. There's differences in culture, differences in operation. So a lot of these tips will focus around how to tell your story in a compelling way, how to draw threads from what you've done previously to the skills you want to showcase in the new role. Those things are still applicable, even if you're going from one company within an industry to another. So even if you're not planning on making a huge dramatic change, these are still relevant tips. Uh, it's important to note too, that what counts as a dramatic change is different for different people. Uh, I have met people that you know worked in, um, high international finance and then chucked it all to go become, a, you know, become like an Alaskan fisherman. Um, that is a real story that somebody actually knew. Um, but I've also met people who went from, you know, something like civil engineering to civil engineering with a different focus at the county level to the state level or something like that. And it was a big transition. So what counts as dramatic will differ by the person. There's no general rule that says this is so dramatic of a change or this is so minor of a change. It's really what it comes down to for you. So with that in mind, you do want to talk about how you got to where you are and then how you get away from it. Uh, whatever you've done in your life led you to this point in your life. It led you to this place. It led you to this time, this position that you're in. And if you want that to be different, something has to change. Even if you haven't made quote unquote mistakes or you don't regret any of the things that you've done, something about your process must change to get to where you are. If you have, you feel a great resume, you interview fantastically, you have great connections, a great network, but they're all geared around the industry you want to leave, then some of that may need to change, even if you didn't think any of it was incorrect. For a long time in my career, I was a diehard suit and tie guy. I swore by the suit and tie. It was my armor. You know, it was, it was my, my power outfit. Uh, and one day I went to an interview. I was interviewing with the CEO of a company. I walked into his office. I had on my best suit. Uh, you know, predictably it was an all black suit, Jill. So don't worry. It was still all black, but I had like a gold power tie. I looked great. I, I go in and the CEO was in a t-shirt jeans and a baseball cap. Uh, I think he had flip flops on and no socks. And he definitely made fun of me. I mean, he definitely busted my chops wearing the suit and we still had a great relationship. And I ended up, you know, working for him, getting that job, but it just goes to show that things, there's no such thing as a universally correct answer. There's things customized for what you want. So it's important to know that. So we're going to talk about my, my top 10 tips because this webinar is obviously designed to be broadly applicable. A lot of these are going to be top high level tips. We're not going to get super into the nitty gritty. Uh, I encourage anybody that wants to get into the nitty gritty to contact me after this webinar. I'd love to jump on the phone with some people. Um, I'm happy to set up consultations, things like that, but we'll talk a little bit more about that process at the end. 
Um, and of course, we are going to do some Q&A on this webinar. So if you have some more specific questions, we'll do some Q&A at the end. Um, and I'm also going to really hit some of the points where I see people get stuck a lot. I've now guided hundreds of people through career transitions. Um, you could probably bump that number up to thousands if you count the people where as a hiring manager, I took chances on people that were interviewing from outside the industry. So I've seen mistakes people make. And the good news is there's only a couple. The bad news is everybody makes them. So I'm gonna talk about them a little bit and hopefully hope you, help you avoid those mistakes. So how did you get where you are and where do you wanna go? These are important things to think about. The reason they're important to think about is people take them for granted. People take for granted that you got to this point that you're at because it was the default or you were always going to end up here. There was no other alternative, uh, but that's not true. You worked hard to get where you are. You put some effort into building a certain skill set to building connections. Uh, and many people feel stuck because they feel like all of that is either non-transferable, you know, that there's nothing, a hundred percent of it has to get thrown out if they want to make a change. Uh, or they feel like, because they did take the default, the path of least resistance, they feel like anything else is going to be so much more effort, so much more difficult, and they don't realize that they've actually laid a lot of the groundwork already. It's important to think about why you want to leave. Um, people, you know, there's the old saying that people don't quit jobs, they quit managers, they quit cultures. I find that's often very true. Uh, I had a client once who told me that she absolutely hated the industry she was in. She said, it's so toxic. Everyone is a shark in this industry. Everyone stabs you in the back. There's no, you know, there's no camaraderie of any kind. I hate this industry. I said, that sounds brutal. How long have you been in the industry? She said, eight years. That's a long time. How many companies have you worked for in that time? And she said, well, one. Well, if you only worked for one company in that industry, how do you really know that this is a systemic industry problem and not just a problem with your culture and, and your company. And lo and behold, she started doing a little more networking outside of her company and found that no, in fact, her company really had the reputation for being the worst uh, in that space. Uh, and so she did, she kept her role and she kept uh, her industry, but she moved to a different company and was much happier. So it's important to know why you want to leave. If you're a, a, a vet, you know, you do veterinary medicine and you say, I hate my job, I want to leave. Well, saying I hate my job because I love animals, but I hate medicine is going to lead you in a different path than saying I love medicine, but I'm allergic to animals. Those are both good reasons to leave veterinary medicine, but they're going to lead you in very different directions as far as what you do after. And if you don't take the time to know the answer to that for yourself and know the answer to that for other people, you're going to really limit your ability to connect with people, tell your story. You know, if you can't articulate that you want to leave medicine because, or veterinary medicine because you love medicine but are allergic to animals, then people are going to suggest, oh, well, if you don't want to be a vet, you know, maybe go into animal rescue. That doesn't solve your problem. You know, it's a different role. It doesn't solve your problem. So think about those things. Why do you want to leave? Don't ignore that. And don't just say, I want to leave because I hate my job. That's, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for you. You need to know real answers to these things. Um, or you're not ready to start anywhere. So how do we go from here to there? You are somewhere you don't like. You've got your, your reasons for not liking it. Um, and by the way, that's maybe not a five minute conversation with yourself. That might be a week, a month conversation with yourself, really understanding why. But I'll give you top tip on, on how I help articulate why you want to leave. Imagine that you were not allowed to leave your job. For whatever reason, it's just it's the only job you'll ever have for the rest of your life. You are stuck here. You've got a contract, something. You cannot leave. But you have a blank check to change any three things about your job. Change any three things, but you have to stay. Well, that's a very different question to ask yourself than do I want to stay or not. If you say do I want to stay, there's usually an easy answer. This is a more difficult question. It's a more unusual question, so it's going to kind of force you to be a little more creative. But whatever those three things you want to change, those will typically guide you in the direction of what do you really hate about this job? What do you want to leave? Maybe you love your coworkers. Maybe you even love the work that you do. You just hate the industry it's in. Or it could be the opposite. Maybe you love the industry that you're in, but you hate the work you do. There's a lot of things that could be different. Um, and when you make that list, that'll help guide you. 
once you have that to start with, and I, I do really recommend starting there because it's a great foundation point to recognize, to build off other questions. We talk about what are you good at? What do you bring to the table? Who are you? What do you want out of the world? What do you want to give to the world? These are important questions. These are the things that will keep you from just going to a new job. I'm going to tell you a secret. If you want just a new job, it's really easy. If you don't care what that job is and you're not really super focused on long-term career health or anything like that, almost anybody here can get a job in a week. It might be a terrible job. It might be uh, not anywhere near what you want to do. It might be low paying, but a job itself is not that hard. A job where you are happy, where you do productive, powerful work, something you're proud of and you care about, that takes more time, takes more investment. Know that and don't get discouraged. It's worth taking that time. Everybody obviously has, you know, we don't have infinite time. We have bills. We need money. Totally recognize that. But it's worth taking an extra week, an extra couple of weeks to not just rapid fire click apply now on 40 jobs on Indeed a day. Don't do that. Give, it, give yourself some time to really think about what you truly want. On that same note, find what someone else wants in you. It's easy to say, well, I'd be, oh, it'd be great if I could do this, and you kind of make up some sort of dream job. It's more productive to say, who is looking for me right now? The things that I can do, uh, the things that I bring to the table, who needs those things? Move away from strict job role and think about communities, organizations, um, efforts. Think about who out there needs you, and that will help guide you towards some productive work. Uh, a, a big mistake I see people make, and this is one of those mistakes I talked about where I see kind of 95% of people make this mistake, is they feel as though if they focus on their job role first, everything else will fall into place. The reality is that's almost the exact opposite. You want to focus on everything else first, the job role will fall into place. Seek out communities that you belong to. Seek out organizations doing work you care about. Seek teams that have similar values and mindsets to you. Seek out a boss that you admire. Any of those things, if you fill those things in first, then not only will the role itself work out, it'll probably work out much better. And you might be open to things that you never considered before. There are so many different things you can do to provide value to the world, you couldn't possibly list them all right now. If I told you to take a pen and paper and list every job that exists, you would, run, you, would, you would even make it past the first page. Like we ask kindergartners, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there's six jobs that they name. There's firefighter, you know, business person, uh, astronaut, doctor, right, teacher. We don't really get much better at that question as adults. Uh, most people on this call could not, off the top of their head, name more than 50 jobs. You know, you'd name your job, you'd name the kindergarten jobs, and then you'd maybe name the jobs of people you know and interact with. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics has over 100,000 job categories. And one of those categories, for instance, is teacher. But of course, we know that the million teachers in the United States do not all have the same job. So there's so many things you could do. Don't close yourself off to trying to narrow it into one specific role. Look for those other things first. The role will come. Then when you find those people, convince them to want to work with you as well. When you find that community, you find that organization, you want to talk to them. So let's talk about how to do that, how to get them to want to be a part of you uh, as, as much as you want to be a part of them. So when you're thinking about what you bring to the table, this is, again, one of those, uh, one of those mistakes 95% of people make. They make their entire job hunt or career transition process about them instead of about the, the value that they bring to the world. I love calling your talents gifts. I love this terminology we use. We use this very extensively at Amla Vida. We talk about gifts as things that come naturally to you, as things that are, are talent skills. But the reason I love calling them gifts is they're not gifts to you. They're gifts you give to other people. These are the things that you bring to the table for others. And a gift is worthless if you don't have somebody to give it to. So think about that in terms of who can you help with these things? Uh, if you have, if you have that talent for numbers, like you've got one of those mathematical minds, uh, and you can make numbers dance, you you can work Excel spreadsheets like magic. You're probably not just doing that in your house for fun. 
right? Maybe you are, I don't, I don't judge, but you're probably doing that for somebody. So think about it in those terms. Who needs you? Who is absolutely desperate to have you? That can lead you to some interesting transitional paths. You can end up in industries that feel very uh, unfamiliar because they're desperate to have you. They're the industry that doesn't have someone with your background. Uh, you know, if you look for cultures where they attract a certain kind of background and you're not of that background, that can often mean you bring a lot to the table. So it's worth thinking about yourself. It's worth being a little selfish here. What do you want to do? What makes you come alive? Even if it's just, I love sending emails. Um, you know, I was talking with another member of our team at Amalavita earlier, uh, and she was talking about consumer insights and working out, you know, uh, data metric. And she, her eyes lit up like it was Christmas when we were talking about new data points to add to the Excel spreadsheet. Great. If that is something that truly makes you come alive, find somebody that needs it. If what makes you come alive is being outdoors, driving, doing something, then don't, don't be that. Then don't be an accountant. Find something where you will thrive because you'll always move farther in it. Now, I think this is one of the most important steps. Uh, and if we're going to talk about those big mistakes everybody makes, the big mistake is that people just breeze over this. They, they ignore it completely. Uh, if you have ever had a boss that you hated, or a company culture that you felt was very toxic, or an environment you felt was very stifling or suffocating, then I'm gonna make kind of a bold accusation and say, you probably saw some red flags to that effect before it got so bad that it made you quit. There was probably some warning sign earlier on. And the reason we don't see those warning signs is we're making that early mistake of being so, so focused on just, I need a job, I'm gonna get this job right now. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna take it because I don't value myself high enough to argue differently. And then we end up in environments that don't work for us. I have, been, I have worked for companies where I love what the company did. You know, what the company offered the world I thought was great. But at the level that I interacted with that company, I had a really horrible boss or I had a really stressful work environment. And no matter how much I enjoyed the ideal of what the company did, the reality was, I was so stressed every night, I wasn't saying goodnight to my kids. I, you can't live like that. You have to have uh, a strong sense of what your personal values are so that you recognize if the company or the boss or whoever you're interacting with doesn't share them or doesn't have something complimentary to them. So please take the time to respect yourself in that way. That's going to mean at some point doing the unthinkable and turning down a job. I know there are some people that have no problem with that. And there are some people, clients that I've talked to that they, they think that's insane advice. They think, how could I, I'm on the job hunt. How could I turn down a job? But if you are, if you've never turned down a job offer, then I guarantee you, your career is not as fulfilling as it could be. It's not as productive as it could be. And you're not where you're supposed to be. It, it's just so unlikely that every opportunity that came your way was the right one. Sometimes there are red flags there and, and you want to make sure that you see those. So understand what values are important to you. They don't have to be crazy out of the box. I mean, they can conform to the ideals of your, uh, of your culture, of your friends, your family. Um, you know, they can be, my, my values are pretty cut and dry. My kids are up here and that's value number one. I, everything else in my life stems from, am I doing the right things for my kids in the long term? Am I being the best provider for them? Am I being the best dad for them? Am I doing things that allow me to still have time and relationship with them? That's it. That's not. I mean, a crazy innovative value, right? I'm not probably shocking anybody with that value. It doesn't have to be shocking, but you have to know it. And therefore, if I see a job where it's like, oh, this is the title you want and it's great money and it's uh, an awesome company doing really good work in the world and there's no other problems, but it's 70 hours a week and it's 80% over the road travel where you won't be home at night, I'm going to pass. Even though it sounds like an awesome opportunity, it's not a judgment, but I'm going to pass because that doesn't align with what my values are. So now, how are we finding that? So you, want, you, you know why you want to leave. You know you want to probably change industry entirely. You, you've taken some opportunities that maybe now you're thinking about some of these mistakes I've said, and, and you're saying, I have made some of those mistakes. I want to do differently. I want to make my next job not the same as the last four I've had. Okay, how do we do that? How do we completely leave the world behind, but not leave behind everything we built there? 
play. So the first one is, I want to give you a powerful, powerful tool. That powerful tool is the phrase, yes, if. I want you to strike out the word no from your vocabulary while you're on the job hunt. And I want you to replace it with the phrase, yes, if. So you see an opening, you see an opportunity, you see a, a, a company, you make a contact with somebody. The question arises in your mind, could I work for them? Could I work with that organization? Could I bring value there? I want you to just automatically say, yes, if, and then you can list, if you list 15 things under if, that is okay. But I want you to start with yes, if. And if it turns out that the 15 things under if are, are really impossible to do or, or, or really costly to do when you're not gonna get there, that is okay. But don't start with no. Starting with yes, if puts you in a mind frame to evaluate opportunities better, it puts you in a mindset to consider why you wouldn't take something if you wouldn't. Too many people say no to something, and even if they're right, even if that's not a good opportunity, they don't know why, and therefore they can't course correct. If you see 50 opportunities and you said no to each one, you said, no, I'm not gonna apply to that, no, I'm not gonna reach out to that person, but you never really gave some thought to why, then the problem there is, you don't have any new insights for yourself. You don't have any new direction, nothing to, to give yourself. Um, the other thing that I want you to do as you're moving forward is you need to be talking to other people. All information in the world is in other people's minds, not in yours. The transition from one career to another, a lot of people think of it like a jigsaw puzzle, and that's a totally wrong analogy. I'll explain why. If you have a jigsaw puzzle, and you think hard enough at it, you work hard enough at it, eventually you get a complete picture. But now I want you to imagine that there's a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and I only give you 50 pieces. I don't even tell you which 50 they are. It, you know, maybe they're middle, maybe they're edge, but I only give you 50 pieces. Well, it doesn't matter how good at jigsaw puzzles you are. It doesn't matter how long you think about it. It doesn't matter how long you stare at them or how often you turn them over in your mind until you get a majority of those other 950 pieces, you simply cannot solve this puzzle. That is what a career transition is like. You will never, ever come to your perfect role or your dream role or even to the dream journey by sitting in your room or office or kitchen and thinking about it. Never going to happen because you already have all the information that you have. Thinking doesn't create new information. It just puts together information you already have in different shapes. You need new information. You need to put more knowledge into your database. That means going out and talking to people, keeping that open mind. So if you're talking to somebody and they say to you, hey, you know what you would, what you would really like? And they give you some sort of crazy idea that is totally out of left field, default to that first rule, yes, if, and say yes, and say, who else should I talk to about that? Do you know anybody else that does that? Go down these rabbit holes. That is, is critical. And along the way, you're also going to be doing a lot of great networking. You're going to be having a lot of great conversations. But you would be so shocked at how many people build 90% walls around themselves at the start of this journey. There are a huge list of things that can be important to you. Um, I'm not going to go over everything on this list, obviously. But know which one of these things are important to you. Because obviously, up to this point, I've talked about some kind of high-minded ideals about aligning your job with your values and your purpose and your passions, but there are real practical elements to this. Your job is also your livelihood. It also supports you. These are important aspects. Some people care about commute. Some people don't. Some people care about benefits. Some people don't. You know, often with um, you know, spouses, it really maybe only one of them has to have benefits. So if both uh, members of a married couple are working, one can focus on benefits and the other can sacrifice that for other things, maybe different earning potential. So no one set of things is going to be perfect for everybody. You have to have this discussion with the people in your life that are going to depend on it uh, and kind of give these things some prior thought. But that's the important lesson, another big mistake. People don't give these things any prior thought. And so then when they're presented with an opportunity, they're not well equipped to evaluate how well that lines up with what they really need. Um, the, the exception of this tends to be, I mean, if you're someone that is dealing with a chronic medical condition and you already know that you need that, benefits are going to be forefront in your mind. Uh, if you're somebody who you know, always relies on public transportation because you live in a city where cars are impractical, like you live in Manhattan or something, 
you're going to think about commute and location, but it's going to be different for everybody. And it's good to think about the wide variety of these things. Wardrobes on here. Hey, I'm not a suit guy anymore. Uh, now, finding is, I want to say finding is half the battle, but let's say finding is not really half the battle. Finding is like a third of the battle. And the rest of the battle now is, okay, you've got your target. You found something that you want to do. How do you start to now make that transition? This is where we're going to get in the meat and potatoes. I know a lot of people that are, that are here on this webinar are here because this is where they're stuck. Um, probably maybe, maybe a third of the people on this webinar now probably have a good idea of where they want to go. Um, maybe two thirds don't, but, but maybe a third of you have a good idea of what your new industry should be, or at least maybe the direction you want to go. And you're saying, well, I've been in banking for 25 years. How do I transition to this whole new thing when this is what I've done all this time? Well, fortunately, even if you're staying in banking, this advice is going to apply to everybody. Don't rely on your history, period. Too many people lead with their history. They lead with their past. That's not where we want to be. I'm going to use a dating analogy because I love dating analogy. I think a lot of them are really good in the job hunt. Imagine that you went on uh, a first date or even were asking somebody to go on a first date and your credentials that you list for why they should go on a first date with you or maybe why they should go on a second was listing all of your previous relationships and how good of a partner you were in those relationships and, and what great things you did um, with that. That's not where you want to lead. You want to lead with a strong statement about your future with this organization, with this person, with this partner, whoever it is. You want to start with the future. Let them envision how you can work together. And you don't do that by showing your past. Your past which we see a lot on resumes, and we'll see it also on LinkedIn profiles and things like that. Your past is supporting documents. Those are the supporting statements to your thesis. It's proof that what you said initially was true, but you can't lead with it. One of the other reasons you don't want to lead with it is your past tells, if you, if you list out your past, that tells somebody that your future looks like your past. But the whole point of this is you don't want your future to look like your past. You want it to look something totally different, and we want to build on that foundation. So am I saying completely eliminate all past jobs from your resume? No. But what I'm saying is focus instead of on maybe accomplishments, which I know is pretty typical advice, and focus on skills learned. Focus on hurdles overcome instead. Focus on what your journey of discovery was. If you were at a role... Um, for maybe several years and you, you got one or more promotions. That's a great one to talk about. Why did you get promoted? What skills did you demonstrate? What maybe leadership or work ethic did you demonstrate to get promoted? Focus on areas where you had to learn something new. If you have, um, let's say you've been in marketing for a long time. Like, well, I have my bachelor's degree in marketing and then I had a junior marketing role and then I had a senior marketing role and then I was a director of marketing and now I don't want to do that anymore. Well, that path that is in that resume shows a path of very easy transitions where you didn't necessarily have to learn anything outside of your box. But instead, talk about what new things you had to learn. Or when I transitioned from this role to this role, what was totally different? Um, what was totally alien to my previous experience that I was able to pick up, learn on the job? Uh, if you've ever spoken to you know, an attorney, they always say, Law school doesn't teach them anything. You know, you learn everything in that first year of apprenticeship. Um, so not that law school teaches you nothing, you know, but they always say that they, the majority of what they learn is in that apprenticeship. That's a great thing to lean on is to say, you know, I, when I landed in this role, I was totally unprepared. And here's how I hit the ground running very quickly. So you want to talk about how you can move forward with them based on your ability to have that forward momentum not just a list of your past experience. Even if your past experience is extensive and impressive, this is a hurdle for a lot of people. They feel like, well, I worked so hard to earn this 30-year resume. I, I don't want to move away from it. But if you're looking to make a change, you have to change something because if you, there was the point at the very beginning, if you change nothing, you can't move. A car will not turn on its own if you don't move the wheel to the left or right. So you have to tweak something or you're not going to change where you are. Don't feel like you've got to stick to a timeline on your resume either. Um, 
I'm going to tell you something as years of being a hiring manager, I have looked at resumes until my eyes bled. I have seen, I'm going to say conservatively 10,000 resumes in my career, both ones submitted to me for jobs, ones I've reviewed as a resume specialist. Um, they're very bad. Most resumes are very, very bad. Uh, you don't have to stick to the kind of standard formatting that's on a resume. A resume is not a legal document. There are no requirements on a resume. A resume is a marketing flyer. And just like all marketing documents, the rules are you do whatever is most effective. You do whatever highlights the things you want to highlight, steers the conversation the way you want to steer it, uh, and, and talks about things you want to talk about. So don't feel like you have to adhere to some format or formula when you don't. If another way of telling your story tells your story better, tell your story that way. Likewise, write compellingly. Um, I want to tell it an interesting story. I had a recent job role that I was helping um, administer, and 450, 460 people applied to it. And two sent in a cover letter. Uh, you do a lot more with writing a cover letter, sending some additional piece of information, something like that, than with uh, just a resume alone. Put yourself at the head of the pack there. Make a compelling statement. Again, to use a dating analogy, uh, if you send kind of a copy-paste message to every person on your dating app uh, or on the, the dating website, and it's very obviously copy-pasted, uh, even if it's written very well, even if it's beautiful, if it's not customized, everyone can tell. And it just doesn't, doesn't provide anything compelling. It doesn't get you anywhere. Now, as a recruiter, I spent all of my time on LinkedIn. I mean, all of it. You will do far more for every part of your journey of discovery, every part of your career transition, every part of the actual mechanics of the job hunt by taking the time you used to spend just clicking apply on Indeed and instead spending it really creating content on LinkedIn. Don't just scroll LinkedIn passively. Go on there and comment. Go on there and share people's posts. It is social media. 95% of people on LinkedIn never post anything. Um, you, you can see this if you make a post yourself because it'll show you, you know, how many people like it. Oh, 15 people liked it, 20 people liked it, 4,000 people viewed it though. And you think, how, does it, how is it that 4,000 people viewed this and only 20 people liked it? It's not because the content's bad, it's because that's what just most people do on LinkedIn. But that means your audience is huge and no one is competing with you for that audience. As a recruiter, when I wanted to hire, I don't wanna look at 500 resumes. And if I post a job ad on Indeed or something like that, that's what, what I'm gonna do. So instead, I'm gonna to go to LinkedIn and try to find people that are already talking about that job, already doing that job, already interacting uh, with other people, other professionals doing that job. So if you're out there, talking with people, all of the things we talked about in step one, how do I talk to more people? Um, there's never been a better time. Everyone's on LinkedIn all day right now. We have nowhere else to be. So get on there and you know, find people who are commenting and comment on, on their posts, um, you know, share their posts. If you're looking for people to connect with, do a content search for whatever your area of interest is. Um, just put that keyword in the search bar, find people talking about it, and then great tip, you find a post talking about the subject that you're interested in. If you click on the number next to the likes, it'll pull up a list of every person that liked that post. Well, guess what? They're probably people you want to talk to because they like the same thing that you're interested in. That's a great starting lead list to just start going to their pages, comment, uh, you know, thank them for sharing things, go out there and interact. Again, a top mistake 95% of people make, they don't interact at all. They expect the world to come to them. The world cannot read your mind. I, as a recruiter, I, I have no way of knowing anything about you that you don't tell me. So get out there and make it compelling for people to interact with you when you're putting your LinkedIn profile together and you should have one. Um, you know, put something interesting on your headline. Don't just put, uh, don't just put your job title. You know, my, my LinkedIn headline is helping people do what they love. I don't really need to put director of career services at Ama La Vida on my headline because nobody who's looking at my LinkedIn profile either A, needs to know that or B, can't find it out because it's gonna be listed in my, it's the top job on my job uh, history. So instead, I'd rather give people something to hang on to, something to, when they first land on my page, be compelled by. 
and say, oh, helping people do what they love. What does that mean? You know, there's, there's, I'm, I'm interested. There's more, uh, more to learn here. Uh, they don't feel that I'm summarized. Likewise, hey, don't write your LinkedIn like a resume. Um, it's awful. Resume language is terrible. Uh, nobody likes reading resumes. We write them that way because we have extremely limited real estate and everything has to be compressed into this very small space. That's not the case on any other platform. So that weird kind of clunky, no pronoun way of writing that we do on resumes, we just don't need to do that on a LinkedIn summary. On a LinkedIn summary, you can write it like it's a, a public profile. You can use pronouns. You can talk about things you're passionate about. Uh, you can say I, you know, you don't have to limit yourself and say distinguished professional with 15 years experience, X, Y, Z, leave that for the resume. It just doesn't need to be on LinkedIn. Uh, you want people to actually enjoy reading this. So write it like a letter. We have never lived in a time when it was easier to let people know what's in your brain. You have so many platforms now, totally free platforms to communicate what you're all about. And they absolutely matter. If you think that a recruiter, a hiring manager is not Googling you, doing their due diligence, going to your LinkedIn profile, you're crazy. They all are, we all are, um, you know. And it's not so much that they're looking for red flags anymore. That maybe was the advice 15, 20 years ago was when social media was first getting started and people were saying, hey, just make sure that when someone searches for your social media, they don't see you with a lampshade on your head and a bottle of tequila in your hand dancing on a table. That's probably still true, but that's not really what people are looking for. I'm not looking for things to count against you. I'm looking for things to count in your favor. If you are applying for a new job uh, in a new industry, there's a lot of competition. There always will be. You have to stand out among that competition. Another one of these mistakes 95% of people make. And I feel so bad when I see people make this mistake because I know it's demoralizing and frustrating and, and you don't deserve to be demoralized or frustrated. But they say, I sent in my resume. I was perfectly qualified for that job. I had every skill they were looking for. I had every qualification they had listed on their, you know, on the job ad. Um, you know, there were no mistakes on my resume. There's no red flags about me. I don't understand. They didn't even call me back. I didn't get so much as a phone screen. Here's, and, and they think they get demoralized. They think, was I not good enough? Was I wrong? Did I think I was qualified and I really wasn't? No. I'll tell you exactly what happened. You sent in your resume. You were completely right. You were perfectly qualified. So were 200 other people. And I can't look at 200 resumes and I can't make 200 phone calls. What happened was somebody broke the tie. Somebody did something extra. So as I'm going through resumes and you've heard the stats six seconds at a time, 10 seconds at a time, um, and I'm maybe clicking on LinkedIn profiles. And if I see, you know, blank LinkedIn profile, blank LinkedIn profile, oh, now I click on one and this person has articles they've written. They have links to publications they've made. Um, they have a lot of recommendations. They have a lot of interaction. They're talking with other professionals in their industry. I, all right, now, now I'm interested. Now I know this person is serious enough that I'm going to click. By the way, there's no filter on what you can post. So if you've been in banking for 25 years and you wanna be in marketing, you talk about marketing. You, you share stuff from marketing leaders. You share um, you know, great top tips for email campaigns or for um, you know, visual advertising or graphic design. You share whatever you wanna talk about because that's what I see. Uh, I give this example sometime. I had a, a client who wanted to be in contract law. It's very, very focused on being in contract law. But all he talked about was baseball. He just he was a big baseball fan. Um, he loved baseball. He loved the Mets. He shared stuff about the franchise all the time. I interesting stuff. I mean, he was clearly very knowledgeable, but that made him the baseball guy, right? That's what you thought about when you thought of him. Because if you scrolled through his feed, it's all baseball. It's all, you know, baseball. His profile picture was him at a Mets game. Uh, so that's what he became. That means that when people are, you know, if a contract law job happened to come across my desk, it didn't immediately trigger me thinking about him. But if I saw a cool piece of Mets uh, memorabilia, I would immediately message him and say, hey, I saw this thing, you might like it. So you can create the reality of your new transition by just talking about it all the time. If this guy had wanted to work for the Mets franchise, he'd be, he'd be a shoe in, but trying to get a position in contract law, he, he wasn't selling himself. So you can create that existence for yourself just by speaking it into existence. 
Uh, that same point applies here. Network, network, network. Applicant tracking systems are horrible. Oh, Lord, are they horrible. Um, how many of you have sent in you know, a, a resume and it gets a rejection five seconds later, like a clearly automatic rejection, some sort of weird keyword bounce, something like that. Um, and you're constantly playing this arms race where you're trying to figure out what keywords they are and aren't looking for. And they're trying to figure out what keywords the job seekers have figured out so that they can change them and they change every couple of years. And if you've been out of the job market for eight, 10, 15 years, um, it, it's totally different. You know, the keywords people are looking for are totally different because they, they have maybe a couple, four or five year shelf life. Uh, so these are really awful. And you can spend a lot of frustration and mental energy trying to beat them, or you can just go around. And I absolutely prefer just going around. Find a real person. It is not that hard to find a real person that works at the company you want to work for. Um, I've had people that just emailed me, don't even send me a resume, don't put in through the application system, they just email me, and they have a compelling enough and kind enough demeanor in their email that then we just get to talking and then I say, yeah, come in. If you make those connections, you can get around that. Another great reason to make these connections is sometimes you make these connections and then someone says, hey, yeah, send me your resume. When you're sending your resume to a real person, it's not six seconds. They're going to read the whole resume. It's going to actually go to a human. It's going to go into the correct pile. These things, if all you're doing is clicking apply, you're shooting in the dark so badly, I almost recommend not doing it. You're just going to have such a better result spending your time networking. So I know I, I covered a lot of this, but you really just have to be out there. Um, this is a skill, and I don't want to diminish that many people feel nervous about this. I don't want to diminish that for many people, it's weird, and, and they're not maybe social media butterflies. Um, you know, maybe they're not gregarious extroverts, and so this can be challenging. So I don't want to diminish that, and I want to give a tip for those people. What you write does not have to be brilliant. It does not have to be an essay in length. If you find something that you found interesting to read, uh, then just writing, thanks for sharing this, and then a question. If it's uh, an original article that, that they actually wrote, put thanks for sharing, where did you first come up with this idea? If it's something that they've shared and they're not the original author, you can write, thanks for sharing, uh, where did you find this? That's it. You can start there. These are short, easy questions. Uh, they work over and over again, so you don't have to feel super gregarious in order to put them out there. Uh, it, it, you're not necessarily volunteering any tremendous insight that you're going to be judged on, but you are starting a conversation. The types of posts from companies or from company CEOs that on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram get 100,000 likes and 10,000 comments, on LinkedIn, they get 40 likes and two comments, which means you are much more likely to actually be noticed, to actually get a response, uh, to have someone interact with you. And if you interact a few times like that, it's so much easier than to start the real conversation. If you do send in a resume at that point and you've interacted with me you know, a, a few times, I'm thinking, Jill, Jill, where have I heard that name? Oh, wait, Jill, I recognize this name. Yeah, she comments on the company LinkedIn page. Every time we post something, she has, you know, she'll ask an interesting question or she'll, or I see her sharing it on her own page. Sharing is great. Um, you know, taking a, a something from a company or a CEO and, and sharing it amplifies them and it shows that you're serious because it shows to me the, you know, the head of the company or the hiring manager that you are serious enough about this industry to be sharing this stuff on your own page. That that message becomes part of your message. So, the real answer here is just putting yourself out there. Um, you can start slow if you're more introverted, but let it build from there. When people do answer, follow up, ask, uh, answer questions people ask you. As you build up that activity, you absolutely will see more and more of that activity come. Now, you're on an interview. Might not be a formal interview. Might be a, an informal interview. Somebody might, you might just end up in a conversation with somebody. Everything is an interview. So how do you tell a story from banking and make it relevant to somebody in food production? How do you do those things? Well, I use the, the example of the current CEO of, or no, the current president of Impossible Foods, which is the 
company that makes like plant-based burgers and plant-based meat. Well, their current president worked for Motorola. He's never worked in food. He's never worked in the restaurant industry. He's never worked in food production of any kind. He worked for Motorola. He worked in telecom. But what Impossible Foods needed was somebody who was a master at assembly line production, at somebody that could take 100 different variables, combine them reliably into a product that could ship 10,000 units a day. That's what they needed. They didn't have that. Motorola had it. They had this guy because that's exactly what phones are. It doesn't matter that it's phones or burgers. What matters is combining 100 ingredients, shipping 10,000 units. He could do it. So that's your story. Forget about the widget. Forget about the, the product. Certain things are universal. Leadership skills are universal. Uh, problem solving skills are universal. So when you're telling stories, tell stories about that. I like the star model. Um, it's a good reminder, situation, task, action, result. Uh, here's another way of thinking about it. All your stories have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. A lot of people tell stories that have a beginning and a middle and no actual resolution. So most important about the situation, task, action, result, you have to explain the situation in such a way that somebody not in your industry gets it. If you are transferring industries, remember, you can't overload with jargon. Someone from outside your industry might not understand why a certain situation is dire. Um, I spoke with someone recently, and we were, we were going over this, and she worked in finance. Uh, and she was telling me about a particular kind of SEC report, um, and that, you know, she had a really good story for it. But I, not being a finance guy, didn't have the same kind of intuitive understanding of why the mistake she was describing was a big deal. And then she realizes, she goes, oh, you know, that's, that's true. Everyone in my industry would immediately understand why that's so important, but people not in your industry don't. No knowledge is common knowledge. Everything is specialized. So whatever you know, it's specialized to you and, and remember that. So first, tell me why the situation was dire. Make sure that I understand why this is a big deal. Um, tell me what you had to do about it and why, why it had to be you uh, or why you were the best choice. Tell me about your action, and this is the key. This is critical. And if you don't write down anything else, write this down. Why, uh, why that action was something that you could do that nobody else could do. What did you bring uniquely to that? You know, say something like, "Now here's what everybody else will do in this situation, but what I knew was," and tell the action. Then you tell the result. Make sure you celebrate the win. So many people skip this. Again, we're the 95% mistakes I keep talking about. They say what they did, and then they leave you hanging. And I have to ask, like, well, so did it work? Did you get the reports filed? Did the SEC audit you? Like, oh, no, 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 we made a billion dollars. Great. Well, tell me that. Celebrate the win with me. Uh, don't leave me hanging. It's like telling the joke and not telling the punchline. Make sure you round it off with a success. Um, and if the, even if the story isn't successful, the result can be, and that's how I learned always to do this. And ever since then, I've been able to tackle this particular project. There has to be a result. All right. Use open-ended questions. Um, I'm not going to go through necessarily all the details here, but some important stuff when you're talking about these. Uh, keep the story to the important details of the story. It's good to practice a few good stories about yourself before you go on an interview. Have one or two of these silver bullet stories for yourself. Um, just stories that are good that, that you feel comfortable telling because believe me, you'll get the opportunity to tell them. You don't have to worry that they're not going to ask the right question because if it's a good story about you, it will answer many questions. Um, my biggest point about, about negotiations is do. That's my biggest point. 10% uh, of women negotiate for, um, for their salary, for anything. Maybe like 70% of men do and 100% of everyone should. You always should because no one ever takes a job offer off the table because you negotiated reasonably. You might not get everything that you ask for, but I have never pulled a job off a table because someone negotiated. So you really have nothing to lose as long as you're polite and reasonable. Now, here's my biggest point when you, when you land something. You may land a transitional job closer to what you want that's not all the way there. For instance, one of my clients, she was in marketing, she wanted to be uh, a writer. She wanted to write articles, journalism, things like that. She was full-scale marketing. So you know what she did as a transitional job? It was a great choice. She joined the marketing department for a publishing house. So now she's not necessarily doing writing yet, 
but think about all the connections she's making. Think about how if she lands on that job and really crushes it, all the opportunities she will now have that were different when she was marketing for a food distribution company. That wasn't giving her any opportunities to write. But if she's marketing for a company that deals all in publishing and writers, those are connections she can make. It's pretty easy to go to you know, the editor one day and say, hey, can I submit a guest column or something like that? It's easier to make that. So look for those transitional jobs. The transition doesn't have to be all in one move. And then make sure when you land, that's not the finish line. That's the starting gun. You land your, your role. Now you have to crush it and start building that new reputation, building that new empire out of those new skills. People get stuck in a lot of different places. And, and this is just kind of a review because I hit a lot of these, but this is also where we can help. You know, if you want to uh, talk about a lot of these things, this is exactly what career coaches do. Um, I know a lot of people, we had another uh, webinar recently, people asked just what is career coaching? This is it, um, is helping think through all of these things, presenting these questions, being that outside source of information, helping you collect puzzle pieces, challenging those things, giving you practice with your story, um, and even just keeping you motivated when it seems dark, knowing that there is a process and that it is going to work. So that's the question is, what are you going to commit to? Not everyone that's on this call is gonna ever work with a career coach. Some of you are gonna work with career coaches with Amlavita. Some of you may already know somebody that you're working with, but if you are on this webinar, chances are good you're not on this webinar because everything is totally hunky-dory and you are in exactly the job you wanna be in for the rest of your life and you love it and you have no plans to change probably would not have joined this webinar if that was the case. So starting here and making a commitment to yourself that you will do some of these things. You might not do all of them. I know we covered a lot of things, so some things may be more relevant to some people than others, but making sure that you're going to commit to something that you're not just gonna log off this webinar and go exactly back to what you were doing before because we said in the very beginning, the actions you take that led you to here will not get you away from here if you keep doing them. So to give you a little bit of an extra bolster on that commitment. We are doing a promotion for the guests on this webinar. Um, that uh, the special promotion that we're doing for this is if you book a consultation, you don't even have to sign up. If you book a free consultation with one of our client relationship specialists, they're the ones that play matchmaker, get your inf information, go through kind of a deep conversation with you to match you with a coach. If you book, a free appointment with our uh, reputation specialists, or our, our client relationship specialists, using this link here, uh, which Jill will throw in the chat as well, the bit.ly uh, link there. If you just book that, and then you do choose to enroll in a coaching membership with us, you're gonna get your first session free. So we want you to start this engagement process. We want you to start something. Um, so no commitment at all required, but if you book the link, um, and then you do choose, you, you like what you hear and you do choose to move forward, uh, we're gonna give you your first session free. So there, there was my just sales pitch for all this, um, having sat through. And now we've got a little bit of time left. I'm gonna open it up to questions. We're gonna do some lightning round, kind of rapid fire questions from either you put in the chat that Jill's gonna read out. And then again, if we don't get to uh, every question, my email address is right here. Email me, please book that, that link with a relationship specialist if you'd rather do that. We want to make sure that even questions you don't get answered in this webinar do get answered and we do give you that support. So again, it doesn't have to be a client. If you have never talked to me before, you're not a client at all, still email me, still book that consultation. We still want to help. That's it. And I'm going to open it up to Jill to grab some questions from chat. Awesome. That is a very, very informational webinar per usual. So thank you, John. Um, okay, great. So, okay. So really quick. So, Jason, unfortunately, you have to do that now um, before you sign out. But if you have the link open, click on it and you'll be good. But I will not be sharing that link um, after. All right, John, so let's get to, there's a lot of questions. So maybe some of the lightning more loaded round. ones. Yes, lightning round. Okay, so what do you think of people who are able to create their own jobs? Do they reach out to companies and try to get them to create a job for them? Is that even possible? And I have someone in mind, so. <laughs> I would say not only is it possible, I've done it at least three times. Um, yeah. the, literally the role I have now was a role that jointly uh, I'm gonna be the CEO and I created together. Uh, so it absolutely happens. More and more companies are even putting that sort of evergreen job listing on their careers page that says, don't see something 
that fits you, then pitch us, tell us how you can add value. Uh, companies don't have crystal balls. They don't know every possible way somebody could add value to their team. In that same way I said, you don't know all 100,000 jobs that exist. They don't know all 300 million ways they could be helped. So absolutely pitch. The most important thing about pitching a job like that is clarity. You have to have a tight presentation. You can't just say, I want to work for you and I'll do whatever. You have to say, here's what I do. Here's how it adds value. Here's where it, you know, it generates, it solves a problem for you. It saves you money. It increases your revenue. It stops this problem. It fixes the leaky pipe under your sink, something. You have to have a clear presentation of what that is, how you do it, how long it will take, and so on. But if you have that, hands down, you can pitch that. Awesome. All right. Um, do you suggest targeting companies that meet your criteria, even if a job that aligns with your experience is not available? If yes, Absol how? Yes, absolutely yes, because um, many job openings or needs that a company has never make it to a job board. Um, and maybe they, w and one of the reasons that they don't make it to a job board is somebody pitched me six months ago and I, you know, it wasn't the right time, but now I'm like, oh, now I need this particular this sales manager. And hey, you know what? Instead of posting this job uh, online, there was Tim who reached out to me six months ago who would have been awesome for this. Let me see if he's still looking. Oh, you know, he either is still looking or, you know, he's in another job, but he doesn't like it as much and he comes over. Great. There's the job that got filled, never hit a job board because somebody pitched. So yes, absolutely pitch. What's the worst that happens? The worst that happens is you make a great connection. Don't be bitter if it doesn't go anywhere. Make that great connection. Be friends with that hiring manager. Offer something of value. Uh, and you build that network. If you keep doing that continually, you'll get to a point in your career where you'll never apply to a job again. There will just always be someone reaching back out to you saying, trying to headhunt you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so how do you feel about creating original content? I think this was via LinkedIn. And I think you touched on it. You said, absolutely. I do. I mean, I, I blog every yeah. day. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't have to, because I don't want anyone to feel like if right now they do nothing, that tomorrow they have to be at 100. But you don't. You can build to it slowly. As much content as you want to create, though, there's no such thing as too much. So if you feel energized and creative and you want to do it, it absolutely helps. I just don't want to discourage anybody into thinking that if you don't do it, you won't get anywhere. Awesome. All right. Um, do you advise that we, tar that we focus on one position or do you suggest having multiple paths to simultaneously pursue? Uh, multiple paths because I don't think you should narrow it to a position. I think if you're focused on culture and importance of work and purpose, then position could be one of a hundred things. Um, there are, I have multiple skill sets. You know, I, I have multiple things I could be doing. Like I said, I've been a recruiter. I've been a sales manager. I've been, you know, in, in workforce training and development. Those are all things that could be emphasized. I love Amala Vida. And if tomorrow my CEO said to me, Hey, I, there's this skill set that I know you have that we haven't really utilized much. And I want to totally change your role because we want to really lean into it. I love Amala Vida. I'm, I'm super happy with the team, with the culture. So I'm, totally open to a new role within that space. So if you're focused on that, like I said, role will fill in. Awesome. All right. Last one. We didn't get to all of them. So guys, if you have, if you did not get your, your question answered, I wrote down all of them, but please, I'm going to leave that up to you to, to answer these. But um, so go ahead and respond to the follow-up email I'll be sending later. So you can ask John, John, last one, because I think this is a good one. Should I quit my job if I don't like it or line up another job first? It depends on a lot of factors. I lean towards yes. I lean towards yes, but there's caveats. I don't know what your mortgage payment is. I don't know who's depending on your income to eat. I don't know um, what your, your industry is, where you're located. I lean towards yes because you're more motivated if you don't have something holding you back. You're not as demoralized. Um, it's not going to get better. <laughs> you know, you have more time to go search. So I, I lean towards yes, but I just lean towards a responsible yes. I don't lean towards yes if you're going to miss a mortgage payment, someone's going to repo your car, you know, kids are going to starve, something like that. Um, then you may have to be more responsible because I'm not a pie in the sky guy. My feet are on the ground. I know there's a practical element to this. Um, but if you feel like financially you could do it, then yeah, quit. Don't burn bridges, you know, be nice, but make sure that when you quit, you dedicate even more effort and energy into finding your new path. And I think you'll do much better. Awesome. All right. So we are at time, everyone. So like I said, I'm sorry, we, we didn't get to everyone's questions. Everyone, they were fantastic and really great questions. 
So like I said, follow up to the email that I'm going to be sending with the recording and ask John directly. He loves this and it's his jam and all questions, most questions are welcome. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a lot too, maybe I'll do, uh, maybe Jill can set up a follow-up email where I'll, I'll take him an answer so everybody can see answers too and I'll do that in, in the follow-up. Oh yeah, that could work too. Yeah, I think that, that we, could, we could do that, so. Fantastic. All right, awesome. Well, thank you again, John and everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I will be sending a follow-up and again, if you have any questions, I know there's a lot of content consumption. So once you settle and after you get up off this, if you have uh, questions to ask, write them down and we'll get them answered for you. And our client relationship team is looking forward. I told them that every single person was booking a call with them. I know it's not, <laughs> but I told them that. So don't make me a liar. We already have right. some. We already have some sign up. So outstanding. We're outstanding. You are doing the right thing. I'm super excited to talk to all of you. You may work with me, by the way, if you want to, but there's a ton of great coaches. We all go through the same training together. So um, if for some reason you hated the sound of my voice on this webinar, that's okay. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your week, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. All right. See you all soon. Thank you for coming. Bye.